Answer me this. What is God's plan for your life? Most Christ followers believe that God indeed has a plan for their life. But the question is, how do I know what God wants me to do? How do I know what God's plan is for my life? In fact, how can I be 100% confident that I know what God wants me to do? Because the last thing I want is to be off the track that God wants me on. Because if I'm not doing what God wants me to do, I'm not going to be successful in life. And the last thing I want to be is a failure. I want everything that God has for me, but how do I know what God wants me to do? And why is it so hard to discover the plan that God has for my life? And why is it that I'm so uncertain and confused when it comes to making these big choices, these big decisions in my life? Well, all of what I'm talking about gets down to this issue of the will of God. That is the will of God for your life and the will of God for my life. What does the Bible say about this all important issue? Is there just one perfect option, one perfect choice that you and I need to discover in order to fulfill God's purposes for our life, to be on that track, that will of God track that God has for my life. And if I fail to find that perfect option, if I fail to find that one choice, then I miss God's perfect will. And I end up settling for what many call the permissive will of God or God's second best. Wow, that is a big question. And a lot of people, maybe even you, are struggling with, how do I discover what God has planned for my life so that I can center in and be a part of all that God has? Now listen, stay with me to the end of this video because on the back end, I'm going to be raising six very important questions that you need to ask yourself and then answer when you're facing these big decisions, these choices that have big time consequences where you need to choose wisely. So let's get back to this matter of the will of God, because this is really what we're talking about. What is God's will for my life? Well, when we talk about the will of God, the Bible looks at it from three very big ways. One is the sovereign will of God. By the sovereign will of God, I just simply mean God's overarching plan for everything in his created universe. This particular part of God's will, it's secret. He's not letting you or me in on it. Oh, you and I can look behind the fact. We can look down the line of history and we can see God working out what he's doing. But in the moment, no, that's God's business. Has nothing to do with you or me at this point. So we can just set the sovereign will aside, knowing that God is working out his plans. We can be confident of that. The second aspect of God's will is what you might call the spoken will or God's revealed will that will that is that we find in the Bible. He tells us his purposes in his word. And when the Bible speaks directly to an issue, I don't need to ask what is God's will. There it is. It's written in black and white. I can read it and I just obey it. And I know that I'm doing what God wants me to do. And then there's a third aspect of God's will, and that is the specific will. Or to put it another way, God's individual will for your life and for my life. His plan for your life and for my life. What am I to do, particularly when the Bible is silent on issues? And the truth is, the Bible is silent on a great many of the life decisions that you and I make. What career? do I choose? What job do I take? Whom do I marry? What house do I purchase? What car do I purchase? I mean, I could go on. There are lots of big, big life decisions, choices that you and I need to make. And we're wanting to know what is God's will, but the Bible is not speaking directly to that. This is where the rub comes. 
This is where I'm wondering, what is it that God wants me to do? How do I know what God wants me to do? Because the last thing I want to do is miss out on all that God has for me. I want God's best for my life. But the truth is, you, as well as myself, can often feel like we're this little mouse running around in this giant maze looking for the cheese. And the cheese is that perfect option, that perfect will of God for my life. But somehow I never find the cheese. I just keep running into one dead end after another. Why? What's going on here? Well, let me help you understand this. Let me put a diagram up that I think will give us a little understanding of, of what many of us believe trying to find the will of God is. You'll note that there is a yellow circle with a black background. You and I as Christ followers are to operate within the boundary of that yellow circle because that yellow circle represents God's revealed will, his spoken will. It is the Bible. And we're operating within those boundaries. If we're outside those boundaries in the black area, we're outside of what God wants for us. So we want to stay inside those boundaries. But as I've already said, there are many life choices that we simply cannot find in the Bible. It doesn't speak directly to those particular issues. So what many of us have come to is we're trying to find that one perfect option, that dot. You see that black dot in the middle of that yellow circle? That's that perfect choice that we think we need to find. We're forever looking for that particular option. And this is where we get into trouble. This is where a lot of problems come into play. Three in particular. The first problem is what I like to call the problem of doubt. When I'm looking for that one perfect option, that one perfect choice, there is that uncertainty that comes because I'm never really confident that I know this is what God wants me to do. And that uncertainty leads to frustration because I really just don't know. And then that frustration can turn to fear because when things don't work out right, and often in life they don't, even with the choices that we're making, things just don't work the way we want them to. Then we start feeling like a failure and maybe we feel like we've missed out on what God has for us. It's what I call the problem of doubt when I'm trying to find that perfect choice. There's another problem. It's called the problem of impressions. This is where I start using my emotions or my feelings to be the determining factor as to what I choose. A lot of people go at it like this. They're faced with a major decision or a major choice. And then they're looking for what they call the peace of God. Or people will come up to them and say, have you felt God's peace? Do you, do, do you have God's peace on that? And sometimes I'm looking at people going, do what? What are you talking about? My friends, you do not want to make big choices regarding big decisions in life on how you feel. Because I can tell you, I've made lots of big choices over the course of my life. And many of those choices, I did not feel great, but I knew I was making the right choice. Where this idea of the peace of God comes from, it comes from a particular verse in Colossians. And many people have drawn this. They've lifted it out of its context where it reads that Paul is saying uh, that we're to, to feel the peace of God or to let the peace of Christ rule in your midst. But that verse has nothing to do with decision making. When you put it back down into its context, you quickly discover it's dealing with the absence of conflict or the absence of hostility within the body of Christ, within the church family. Paul is saying, let the peace of Christ, let the absence of hostility or conflict rule in your midst. Let that be who you are as you work together as one. It's not talking about decision-making. 
I don't let impressions be the determining factor as to what I choose. That's a big problem. Here's another problem. It's what I call the problem of consistency. When I say consistency, what I mean is, where do you draw the line between those everyday decisions that you and I make all the time, like what time do I get up? What do I wear today? What food am I going to eat? And so forth, as opposed to those big life decisions like, what career do I pursue? What job do I take? Who do I marry? And so forth. But when you've taken the will of God and narrowed it down to the idea of trying to find this one perfect option, this one dot, if you will, you get into the problem of consistency because you start being inconsistent. Where do you draw the line between everyday decisions and big life decisions? They're all decisions. Why is it on this side you're more than willing not to seek the will of God, but on this side, all of a sudden, it becomes an all-important issue. Now, I understand why. These don't have big-time consequences if you make a bad choice, but it's still a decision. And when you're not applying the same rules that you apply over here, you are being inconsistent. Well, listen, there is a much, much better way and I want to share that with you now because God has not put you in a maze like a mouse trying to find the cheese. You're not trying to find the needle in the haystack. The fact is, God has given you freedom to choose. Let me say that again. God has given you the freedom to choose. In those areas where the Bible gives no command, no principle, you and I are free and responsible to choose our own course of action. That means there is usually more than one choice. And we are given the freedom to make the choice that we want. Let's go back to our diagram again. You remember the black background and the yellow circle? the yellow circle representing the boundary that the Bible presents and we operate within those guidelines. But you'll notice this time there are a number of dots or a number of choices because the truth of the matter is that's what life is all about. And when the Bible is not speaking directly to a particular issue, then God is telling you and me that we are free and responsible to make our own choice. So when it comes to decision-making, you and I are free and responsible to choose our own course of action based on what I like to call godly common sense. By godly, I mean that both the means and the ends are governed by what God's Word, the Bible, is revealing to us, these general instructions that it's given. And by common sense, I mean doing whatever it takes to get the job done done. It amazes me how difficult people make this. They get so hung up with trying to find this one perfect option, and God is not doing that to you. He's giving you the freedom to choose, and He wants you to choose responsibly. So, how is it then that this idea of godly common sense work out in day-to-day -day living. Remember I told you there are six questions that you need to ask and answer? Well, we're going to look at those right now because I have discovered that these six questions have helped me immensely when I am faced with these big life decisions, these choices that have big-time consequences if I don't answer them or choose rightly, if you will. So, when I'm faced with these big choices, these big decisions, I need to ask myself six questions. Here's the first one. Have I prayed? Have I prayed? And by praying, I mean, have I prayed up and have I prayed down? That's how I like to look at it. When I talk about praying up, what I'm talking about is affirming God's participation in your life. God is actively working in your life. Sometimes you don't see it. You may not feel it. 
but he's actively working in your life and you need to know that. That's why the writer of Proverbs says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. You and I need to pray up by acknowledging that God is working in our life. And Father, I trust you. I don't lean to my own understanding. And then as I'm praying up, I pray down. And by praying down, I mean asking God for wisdom, his wisdom in this matter. James writes, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all. My friends, this is a prayer you can be confident that God will answer. He tells you, if you're lacking wisdom, if you're lacking the understanding as to what to do, you don't know what to do, ask. And God says, he'll give the wisdom you need and he'll not just give it to you, he'll give it to you generously. So the first question that I always ask myself is this, have I prayed? Prayed up? I've acknowledged God's activity and participation in my life, and I trust Him. I'm not leaning to my own understanding. I'm praying down. I'm asking for the wisdom of God, knowing confidently that God will give me that wisdom. Here's the second question. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? When the Bible speaks directly to an issue, I don't need to pray about it. I already know. I do what God tells me to do. But here is the reality of life. The Bible does not speak directly to many of the issues and choices and decisions, decisions that you and I are making every day of our life. And we need to be confident that when we make that choice, we're making the right choice. So we need to look to what the Bible says. But often what the Bible does, and you need to be aware of this, the Bible does not give you a specific answer, but it can sometimes regulate the behavior of that choice. For instance, take marriage. I married my wife, Debbie, over 46 years ago. But when I decided to ask her hand in marriage, if you will, to just say, Debbie, I want to marry you. Will you marry me? I didn't go to my Bible and suddenly read, Tracy, marry Debbie. Didn't say that. It didn't tell me specifically who to marry. But it did tell me that as a Christ follower, I needed to marry another Christ follower. I needed to marry another person who was under the sovereignty of God, who trusted God like me. But as far as specifically as to who that was, that was my choice. And I chose Debbie. I chose her. That's the freedom to choose with the Bible giving you the guidelines. So that second question is, what does the Bible say? Here's the third question. What do I want? You think, Tracy, what do you mean, what do I want? Doesn't that sound selfish? No, it's not selfish at all. What do you want? I am so amazed at this understanding and view that people have of their Heavenly Father, as if God does not want to give you the desires of your heart. I'm not talking about things that are immoral, things that are wrong. I'm talking about those things that are within the boundaries of God's revealed Word, but God wants to give you those things. God's made you in a unique way. You have a unique way of doing life. There are things in your life that you just love doing. And when you do them, you get this great, deep sense of satisfaction. When I'm teaching like I'm doing now, this is fun for me. I love doing this. I can do it over and over again. Why? Because I'm wired to do this. And so when God gives me opportunities to do this, he's giving me the desires of my heart because this is who I am. I don't want tools. I don't know what to do with tools, but my wife does. Debbie is amazing with any kind of tool and what she can create and produce. 
because that's how she's wired. Let me ask you, how are you wired? How did God make you? You need to know that because that is going to be a determining factor of some of the things that you want. And it's where God's going to begin to steer you in that way because of how he's made you. So you ask yourself, what do I want? Here's the fourth question. Have I asked? Have I asked? And when I raise that question, what I'm really saying is, have I asked the right people the right questions in order to get the right answers? It just staggers me when I watch people make these big life decisions and they don't ask any advice. People, all of us, we are not all-knowing. There are lots of things we simply know nothing about. And yet we're forced sometimes to make a decision or a choice that brings us right into play with those things we just don't know. This is where you need to get into the habit of asking the right people, the right questions, so that you get the right answers. Always when you're facing these big, big decisions, you need to go to that circle of trusted friends that you have or experts that you know that can give you the kind of information in order to assist you in making a very wise and responsible choice. Writer of Proverbs says this, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in abundance of counselors, there is safety. In the abundance of counselors, in the abundance of trusted friends, experts, there is safety. There is wisdom. There is the knowledge and understanding that you need to make the right choice. You need to ask, have I asked, have I asked the right people the right questions? to get the right answers. Here's the fifth question. What do I know? What do I know? In other words, what have you learned over the course of your life from your own personal study, the research that you may have done? There's a lot you know, or from your own personal experience, your life experience. Listen, the older you get, you're going to have a wealth of understanding just simply because of the experience, life experience that you've been through, as well as the knowledge that you've gained living life. And so when you're facing these decisions, you need to ask, what is it that I know? What do I know? And then learn from that and let that help guide you in making the right calls, the right choices. I know that when I'm facing some life decisions, now at this stage in my life, it's a lot simpler than it was years ago. And I will speak now to those of you that are much younger. For those of you that are, say, in your teens or in your 20s, maybe even in your early to mid 30s, you don't have a lot of life experience, but you do have some. And you need to draw from that. You're going to get a lot more as you get older. But right now at this stage in your life, draw from what you know, but don't let that be the only determining factor. This gets back to, have I asked? What does the Bible say? And so forth. Finally, the last question, and it's this, what is the Holy Spirit saying? This is all about your spiritual senses and having your spiritual senses trained to know the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me caution you. I'm sometimes a little leery of bringing this into play because this can be very subjective. And I've watched a lot of people, particularly young people who are not yet at that point in life and developed a lot of maturity, they will think they've got a prompting of the Holy Spirit when in fact it's just a prompting of the pizza they ate the night before. You got to be careful here. But that's not to say that the Holy Spirit is not actively working in your life. He is. And over the years, I have learned to listen carefully to those promptings, to know when the Holy Spirit is prompting. I've had 
my spiritual sense is trained, but this takes time. This takes life. This takes walking with God and knowing his ways. But you need to know that. The writer of Hebrews says something like this. Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Their powers of discernment, that is their spiritual senses trained. The Holy Spirit is working in your life. But again, let me caution you. Don't let this be the deciding factor. You need to bring all these other five questions that I've talked about. You need to bring them into play. Bring them all together and let them form a consensus for you. Have I prayed? What does the Bible say? What do I want? Have I asked? What do I know? And what is the Holy Spirit saying? And when you ask and answer these six questions, trust me, you can begin to lock in on what it is that God is wanting you to do and make wise and responsible choices that lead you to success. Answer me this. Does God have a plan for my life? Oh, yes. God has a plan for your life. But it's not this one perfect option that you and I are now trying to discover where we feel like we're the mouse in a maze looking for the one little piece of cheese. Uh uh. No, God has given us lots of options based on a great many factors I've talked about today. And He's giving you and me the freedom to choose. The freedom to choose to make responsible and wise choices that lead us to godly success. Hey, listen, thanks so much for joining me today and being a part of this uh, experience. And listen, I hope this has been helpful. And if it has, if you'd hit that uh, like button again, because that helps push out this video into the algorithm for many people to get this teaching to help them. And also, if you've not become a subscriber, please hit that subscription button. We can all journey together because it is a journey. And it's a journey with our Heavenly Father as we journey through all that He has for us in life. And as always, God's very best to you.